Okay, good evening. We're going to, Jeff, can you mute your mic or in your speakers, please? So we get the feedback. It's muted. It's the speakers. Oh. Okay, thank you. All right, we are going to um, get started. I'll call the meeting to order. Roll call. Rod? Yes. Leah? She was on. She was there. I can't. Oh. I got muted. Here. <laughs> Jeff? Here. 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 Damon? Here. Danny? Here. Kimberly? Here. And I am also here. Meeting has been properly noticed and certified. Yes. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a volunteer to read the mission statement? You can mute this one. Oh. This one. Oh. The Mount Hall area district in partnership with the community is dedicated to nurturing, educating, and challenging all students, preparing and employing power <laughs> to be productive, responsible, and self-fulfilled members of society. Thank you. Moving on to two agenda and minutes. 2A is approval of the agenda. So moved. So moved. Kimberly, second. Motion by Jeff, seconded by Kimberly. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Motion carries. Moving on to B. Approval of moving on to B. 2020 regular minutes. 2020 regular. Motion to approve. Second. Kimberly. Kimberly. Who's motion? Who's motion first? Um. Um. That was Rod. Was it Rod? Rod. Rod first, and then I heard Kimberly second. Okay. Yeah. Motion by. If everybody could turn off their mic, they could turn off their microphones if they're not speaking. That'd be helpful. Motion by Rod, seconded by Kimberly. For the further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Abstain. Thank, Thank you, Damon. Motion, Motion carries. carries. Moving on to C, approval of the April 13, 2020 special minutes. So, Jeff, you need to. Do we have a motion for approval for the April 13 minutes? Kimberly, motion so moved. Approve. Motion Kimberly, Kimberly, second. Oh. Motion by Rod, seconded by Kimberly. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, moving on to three, oath of office. Jeff, I think this is where you shine right now. <laughs> okay. Congratulations to Diana for another term. Okay. And congratulations to our newest board member, Jessica. Thank you. And uh, 
-hmm. We'll start with Diana. I stand. Reading your oath of office. I stand. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can do this then. Okay. I, Diana Rothmer, having been elected to the office of Board of Education of the Mount Horaberia School District, but have not yet entered upon the duties thereof, swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin, and I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability. So help me God. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Alrighty, Jessica. I, Jessica Aragoni, having been elected to the Office of Board of Education of the Mount Horeb Area School District, but have not yet entered upon the duties thereof, swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin, and will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability. So help me God. Congratulations to you both. Thank you. All righty. All right. Moving on to four, addressing the board. 4A is an introduction for our new school resource officer. Steve, you want to introduce us? Well, absolutely. Good evening, everybody. That gentleman you see in the box in the bottom row is Officer Steve Rosemeyer. This is an event long time in coming uh, in that we've spent a lot of time working together as a community, listening to our community as, with regard to what could a school resource officer look like, and today, we fast forward to the end over the course of the past 20 months, and we're pleased to introduce Steve Rosemeyer. Steve comes to us uh, as not only a, a police officer, but has an amazing background as well as an educator. Worked at Edgewood, uh, worked primarily with middle school students, and we're just so grateful that you've accepted the call to serve in this new role. Hey, everybody, welcome Officer Steve Rosemeyer as our district school resource officer. Yeah. Welcome, Steve. Say, Steve, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and maybe what drew you to the position, please? You bet. Um, thanks for having me tonight. Um, again, my name's Steve Rosemeyer. Uh, I've been a patrol officer with Mount Horb uh, a little over three years. Before that, I was a Dane County Deputy Sheriff for over five years. But like Dr. Salerno said, I also taught for um, my first career was in, I taught middle school, sixth grade social studies for 10 years at Edgewood Campus School. Um, so I kind of have a unique background um, to bring to the position. I really am looking forward to working in the district and in the schools. Um, like. Dr. Slareno said it's a long time coming. I think a lot of people are looking forward to somebody being in the school and hope I hopefully I can come in and problem solve and you know make a safer and secure environment so education can go on without a lot of the other um, problems that educators have to deal with on a daily basis. Maybe I can problem solve them. Um, I, I live here, I live in the district. My kids go to school here. A lot of family and friends in the community, so I'm uh, devoted to the district, and hopefully, um, after after our, uh, COVID stuff go, gets gets out of the way, we can really get down to business. Hopefully, summertime. Well, and Officer Rosemeyer, thank you for accepting the call to serve. We were fortunate in that we had three uh, candidates from internal to the police department who applied, and each of them brought their own unique talents and gifts to the position. 
But Officer Rosemary, I think what made you stand out was your focus, not so much on the law enforcement side of the house, but the importance and emphasis you placed on educating students and being there as a counselor of sorts, being there as a support system for our kids. And I'm grateful to a number of those individuals who are part of the selection team. Allison Gundrum, our student representative, was on the team as was uh, her sister Emma and a number, uh, one more other student who joined us too, as well as some of our board members. And I would be remiss if I didn't um, express my gratitude to the folks at the village, as well as the, uh, the chief, our new chief of police, uh, Mr. Birick, uh, for just doing a wonderful job and helping us shepherd our way through this process. Uh, we want to assure those who've trusted us with this opportunity that um, and may have been just a bit concerned about moving in this direction that we're going to use data to inform the efficacy of our work. And we're going to be in the process of continuing to update our board as well as the village board as to how the program is moving in and hopefully what we envision to be the success of that program. So thank you everyone for being a part of this journey. Thank you to our community for allowing for this to happen. And Officer Rosemeyer, I know I speak for everybody on the call tonight. If there's anything we can do to help you, as you onboard, uh, we stand on the ready, okay? Great, thank you. All right. Just mute, okay. <laughs> All right. We will move on to 4B, school news. Allie, do you have any school news? Um, well, I can't say it's been bustling. Um, with extracurriculars and such, but um, everyone's still, I think, um, getting used to the online software, but all of our teachers have sent out surveys, which is uh, super nice. I think it's starting to get a little bit more um, comfortable for people who weren't necessarily as comfortable when we were first starting with the online program. Um, and while I am a little bit late, I was actually reminded after the last meeting that I never announced the um, results for our DECA state conference because that was actually the week that we ended school um, right when we got back. So we had 19 students that attended that conference. Um, and in addition to competition, they were able to attend different seminars on um, applying for financial aid, as well as entrepreneurship and more business focused seminars. Um, out of those 19 students, we had seven students that qualified for the international competition, which unfortunately has been canceled, but still a good showcase of um, the excellent students that were able to come in. And one of those students, um, we had three students who topped their categories. Um, one of them was Claire Trainel, and it was her first year in DECA at all, um, had never been in DECA before. And she not only took first in principles of finance, um, she actually meddled in every single one of her categories. So the test and then both interviews that she did. Um, so really some awesome uh, results for SCDC, even though um, the international competition has been canceled. But thought I'd get that in there. Someone reminded me that I forgot that last time. All right. Thanks, Allie. Steve, do you have any school news for us? Well, just a few bits of items, if you don't <laughs> mind. Uh, first, we'd like to extend our note of thanks to Damon Piscatelli, as this is Damon's last Board of Education meeting. Thank you for the service you've provided to our community, to our students, to our staff. Uh, I have to believe someone who has carried the light of public education in his heart for so long will continue to do that. Uh, and we hope that you'll still stay connected to us as a small uh, token of the board and administration's appreciation. Uh, Madam President, you have a little something for our, our dear Damon. <laughs> so we know where you live, Damon, and we're gonna, we're gonna drop it by and uh, we're going to just extend uh, our gratitude to you in person, but uh, we wanted you to know that this plaque is just a small way of saying thank you for your outstanding efforts these past several years. Th thank you very much. Uh, it's been it's been very rewarding, and I think that's a credit to all the other board members, the administration, the families, and the students as well. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Damon, this is Rod. I I just want to thank you for the chance to serve with you. 
Uh, I've learned a lot from you. I have appreciated uh, your perspective, perspective. And, and really learned a lot about uh, how you think about things. And, and uh, it's been a real privilege to serve with you. And I'm, I'm really happy uh, to be able to count you as a colleague, but more importantly, to be able to count you as a friend. So thanks for, thanks for being a, a great colleague and a great friend. Thanks. And the feeling is very mutual. Thanks, Rod. On the board table. It looked like maybe Kimberly had a thought too. I see she's unmuted. Yes, I, I just wanted to echo what Rod said, Damon, but it's been so fun to have you seated literally at my right side for all these years. And I, you know, just looking that direction won't be the same. You've given us a lot of wisdom and a lot to think about. So we'll continue your good work and thank you so much for your service. Thank you. And ditto to what Kimberly said, except you were to my left side. <laughs> In other school news, I wanted to recognize an important milestone for our school district yet again. Our entire community has uh, pulled together and done a wonderful job of uh, being recognized by US News and World Reports. When you think about the thousands and thousands and thousands of high schools in our country, and not to mention the 550 plus high schools in the state of Wisconsin, for us to rank in the top 20 now two years running, and moreover within the Madison metropolitan region being noted as the uh, one of the top four uh, high schools in our region, and then of course when you think about our science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, to be ranked number 155 throughout the entire country as a STEM high school uh, is not only a testament to the outstanding, outstanding efforts of our high school staff, just doing some amazing things, but we know that that uh, comes from all the way back to our 4K programs and the support that's given to our youngsters at home. And uh, we are just so uh, over the moon uh, over this outstanding news, and it's a testament again to everybody rolling up their sleeves to make good things happen. And to, speaking of making good things happen, this Friday night's a special night as we recognize all of our student athletes, all 16 schools uh, in the Badger Conference uh, will be lighting their stadium lights uh, in support of our young people beginning at 8 p.m. And as a matter of fact, we're encouraging you families to go ahead and light your porches too, please, your porch lights too, please, just to demonstrate our support for our students I know that there are some questions in limbo, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we come to COVID-19. Um, but as it relates to our sporting season, uh, it's still, still very difficult for not only our young people as it relates to their academics, but also the social and emotional joy that comes from participating in co-extracurricular activities. So won't you please, this Monday night, at, excuse me, this Friday night at 8 p.m., uh, help uh, Light a fire, if you will, uh, uh, and, and put on put on your porch light, please. And thank you. Thanks, Steve. And now we'll move to four C citizens' comments. Do we have any citizens' comments? Any citizens' comments tonight? All right, move on to five, personal transactions. So there was an addendum I saw uh, today. Did everybody get a chance to take a look at that? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Danny, seconded by Jeff. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. And now we'll move to 5B, approval of the co-curricular, extracurricular letters of agreement.
should there have been something attached to approve or is there a standard letter and I missed it? There's nothing there, so I'm confused. Same here. Exactly. Thank you. I, I just went in to double check. It looks like uh, both of those reports were put together. The um, uh, personnel transactions coupled with the co-curricular. I, I understand this the way it's been done in the past. I'll, I don't know why I had it listed as two, so I apologize for the mistake. Um, just so that we are uh, clarifying, uh, might we be able to just uh, look over the document that's provided under the recommendations and employment uh, and status matters, uh, just to confirm those co-ex uh, job responsibilities, please. We'd like to get those letters of agreement out to our colleagues uh, within the next couple of days, please. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Rob, seconded by Jeff. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Moving on to six, consent agenda. 6A is financial reports. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Moving on to consent agenda. Is there anything anybody would like to pull out? Kimberly to approve consent agenda. This is Leah. Kimberly second. <laughs> Motion by Leah, seconded by Kimberly. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Now we're moving on to seven discussion items. Seven A is our COVID-19 update. Dr. Slurma. Well, good evening again. Thank you everyone for taking time to be a part of tonight's meeting. I see a number of our friends and colleagues getting ready to join us for the special education program update. Uh, and I will try to keep my comments brief, but I do know that there's a lot of information that's continuing to evolve. Uh, one of those happens to be a document that was provided just this afternoon, late this afternoon, about 3.30. It happens to be called the Badger Bounce Back Program. Um, and many of you are probably wondering what impact, if any, does this bounce back program have on our schools? It does not have any immediate uh, plans in altering our work. Order 31 um, that is part of this plan uh, talks about several preconditions that are needing to have been met related to the COVID-19 crisis for phase one implementation to occur. That has to do with testing uh, and also tracking of individuals. Prior then to phase one being implemented, then the, uh, uh, the state department of health would uh, issue another order permitting schools to go back into session. So knowing what we know at this time uh, and the possibility, I, I really don't anticipate achieving that phase one threshold prior to the end of our currently scheduled last day of school, which is June 10th. I could be surprised, however, at this point, I have nothing to support that the number of tests that would be required um, would be a, a possible, uh, at least uh, according to the, the current uh, system that we have in place. There is, under the governor's order that was issued last um, Friday afternoon, uh, a provision that indicates that schools would be closed through the end of the academic year. And I wondered to myself, what does the end of the academic year mean? And looking at statute, I found out that st uh, the statute indicates end of academic year is June 30th. If this is a strict interpretation and that is upheld, uh, likely our first session of summer school may be scrubbed. I don't know whether or not there'll be provisions that would allow us to go to um, and, and that phase one rollout continue to occur. One of the things I do know about summer school is that in order for us to get reimbursed for summer school using a virtual platform, the law would need to change. And as a matter of fact, 
Uh, right now, only high school students could uh, participate in a virtual format to have it for credit and have the district receive reimbursable aid on that. Uh, and so right now, uh, the Deputy State Superintendent, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Mike Thompson, has encouraged superintendents to give testimony to uh, allowing for virtual instruction to be permitted in kindergarten through 12th grade and allow for summer school to occur that way. And I've done just that. I've provided written testimony to support that action. I do believe that we're going to need to be as nimble as possible as it relates to our summer programs and we're going to continue to monitor this very, very closely. I would mention that I'm deeply concerned about regression and recoupment, the amount of uh, information that students may lose as a result of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We've been out of school since March the 16th. And then recruitment is the amount of time it takes for kids to catch up to speed as to where they need to be at, despite our teachers' amazing, really, truly amazing efforts to provide a rigorous and relevant curriculum. We're finding that um, there is some concern that this lack of time uh, that our kids have for, for um, interactive uh, firsthand instruction is, is certainly going to be something that we cannot overlook. I'd ask the board to give um, me, by consensus, the opportunity to survey our families about the possibility, and it's just that, the possibility of seeking a waiver to start school early, assuming that lifting the safer at home order would be uh, possible at that time, that we were into phase three of the uh, governor's Badger Bounce Back program. Uh, I do know that the Department of Public Instruction is uh, willing to entertain uh, such requests and uh, my thought would be, provided of course our community could support it and our board could support it, would be to do similarly to what we did back when we had a referendum work, which was starting on or around the week, the third week of August, and we would continue uh, with no additional time added to the schedule but rather end on or around uh, the Memorial Day period of time. Uh, no details, because I haven't even developed the, the calendar. I want to make certain that it was amenable to team members uh, and community members as well. Uh, so I, I, I'd ask in a moment to just, just to get some feedback from the board if that's something that they'd be willing to consider. Also around COVID-19, we're deeply concerned about the mental health and wellness of our students and uh, for that matter, our families. Uh, this is a difficult time for so many, and I want to extend the tip of the hat to Brian Johnson, our Director of Student Services, who has worked in partnership with a friend we all know, uh, someone who helped us uh, during a uh, tragic Nancy Pierce, she's a licensed clinical social worker and works with Journey Mental Health, also happens to be a Mount Horeb resident. She and Brian have created two videos, uh, really uh, very um, timely and very thoughtful uh, videos. One is called How to Respond to Youth Mental Health Needs During the Corona Crisis. And the second video called Understanding Mental Health and Its Impact uh, uh, Based on the COVID Crisis. Uh, this is a takeoff, a spinoff of a training we provided to our faculty and staff now, I want to say about uh, maybe 15, 20 days ago. Um, and then I wanted to let families know that behind the scenes, we've been working with a number of moving pieces related to graduation. We sent out, uh, excuse me, I'm in the process of co-authoring a letter with our high school administration to send out a letter to our senior class outlining the rescheduling of graduation with the safer home order being extended. We did not think it was feasible to have graduation as was scheduled at the end of May. And we've been working with Alliant Energy Center where we host our graduation to find a even larger uh, venue uh, as well as availability of space. And I'm pleased to tell you that we'll be announcing tomorrow, here's a little sneak peek, uh, Sunday, July 26th at 3 p.m. Uh, we will be hosting graduation, assuming everything is safe to do, uh, to do so. Uh, Sunday, July the 26th at 3 p.m. We'll be hosting that in the Alliant Coliseum. That's the larger of the venues. Because we don't know the status of the virus, we will be moving the event to the Coliseum to accommodate for any existing social distancing that would be required for students and attendees at that time. 
Uh, we're also thinking about our students, our Vikings, who have been probably invited to uh, go to London uh, here at um, the start of the new calendar year, part of the London uh, parade. Uh, a survey uh, has been disseminated to families, and we know that a lot has changed for our families. Uh, several of them are impacted, unfortunately, adversely by the economic downturn. And so financial circumstances may play into whether or not they can continue to attend. A concern for the possible resurgence of the COVID-19 uh, virus. And then of course, we know that there are lots of dollars on the line for our families, uh, especially if the British or the American governments do not extend the state of emergency. And then students and parents might start to get cold feet in the fall if, if indeed this resurgence or they're talking about it kind of being a seasonal uh, a virus. That is a lot of money for families to lose and despite all the fundraising you all have done, we wanted to make certain that um, we got the input from our families so that way a recommendation can be made to our Board of Education about continuing uh, on that pathway to London uh, in December. I think it's December 26th through January 2nd. As an aside, I have checked into travel insurance and wouldn't you know much of the travel insurance has changed now to no longer cover pandemics. Hmm. So that means that we do not have the ability to purchase travel insurance in the event that we decide in September uh, to make a different decision than we are making here uh, today. We have a deadline and that's June 1st in order to ensure that as much of our dollars that have already been put down um, have, um, can, can hopefully get back to us. Uh, second to last, uh, food insecurity continues to remain a concern for me and I know many of you in our community. I'm so grateful for Neighbors Helping Neighbors and all they're doing to help support our children. And I would be remiss, of course, if I didn't thank our school nutrition team. We are now serving anywhere between 60 and 70 breakfasts or lunches per day. And I'll tell you, the little pantry that we have out here uh, is being used a great deal. Uh, I'm filling it at least twice a day now, once in the morning and once in the late afternoon. And um, I could sure use some donations. If you have something that you can provide in the way of non-perishable goods, please know um, we would welcome anything that's unopened, unused. Um, that would be something that's not just, I've got an extra in my cupboard, but maybe something special that um, someone might be able to enjoy the blessings that uh, we, we, we have. And lastly, I want to extend my note of gratitude to my friend and colleague, Sarah Straka. Sarah did a wonderful, wonderful job putting together a survey for families about how things are going in the virtual world. Um, how about, Sarah, I share our screen so that way uh, you can talk the team through that, please, and thank you. Sure, that would be great. I have it up as well on my end, but I'll wait till you get up as well, Dr. Salerno. So as Dr. Salerno is pulling it up and sharing it with everyone, uh, we were fortunate. We had an amazing response rate, about 30% um, of about 2,500 students that we have. Um, as of today, we had 758 responses. So I, ha I had asked families to complete um, one survey per child. So that's information on 758 students. The copy that you have was from last Friday. So that's the, that reflects the 735. As you can see from the pie graph, um, each color represents a different grade level. So we had a nice um, dissection of all of our grade levels being representative in this survey. The survey was divided into three parts. The first part focuses on instruction. So we really wanted to see if we were, if we had the right throttle. Did we have just the right amount of daily instruction, too much or not enough? As you can see, um, 80, well, 82% was just right. So that's, that's pretty nice to see. And the next slide is also weekly instruction. So again, just trying to figure out if we're getting the right throttle, especially for the middle school and high school levels where their work um, is going more in a weekly structure. So students have a little more flexibility to uh, return the work and go through the instruction. We want to also know um, if families felt that their child, um, it, 
how how much they had to to support their child as their child worked. Um, and there's a good balance here. I went into this information a little bit more to try and see for the blue one, which is my child needs my support often, is that more elementary students? Um, and that, that was the case. Um, and as you can expect, the yellow, which is my child is able to work um, independently, that is more the high school population. So that so those numbers do reflect that. We also want to monitor how much time a student needs on a Chromebook or, or other device, how much screen time. And over overwhelmingly, family said we had just the right balance of students needing that device versus not needing a device in order to complete their work. Another section on our survey was communication. We wanted to see, again, do we have the right throttle of, of, of how much information is going out to families? So we wanted to look at first at the frequency of communication with classroom teachers. And again, it looks like we have just the right balance of information going out from classroom teachers to families. We also wanted to look from the perspective of, of principals and school district personnel as well. Again, about the same numbers there as well. We've also been using these um, virtual office hours where students can drop in as needed. And we wanted to see how those were, how those were being used or if those were being used or if a person didn't really understand what those virtual office hours were. This is an area that we're going to dive into a little more. When we first started virtual learning, one of my asks for the teachers was, please offer virtual drop-in hours in case students get stuck in an assignment, um, they just need some help. And they've been used in various ways. All grade levels do, do offer these virtual office hours, but teachers are also offering more classroom specific hours. So you may look at this a little bit more and change what these office hours look like, especially at the elementary level, where you don't see as many of third grader Johnny A going to meet another teacher to ask a question he's he's more comfortable asking his own teacher within his own class within his own his own classes uh, virtual office hours so this is an area we're going to work on a little bit more and we just wanted to know if families knew who, who to contact for any academic concerns so we do have an overwhelming number of families who feel like they do know who they can c connect with for those no no we do have those family contacts then that we're going to reach out and um, support those families as needed. Lastly, the third part of the survey was very to learning. We want to, we want to look into any areas where we can just improve upon. One area was just asking families if they had internet access. I think we had about eight respondents who were no's. So again, we can reach to those family members to see if they need a hotspot or how else we can support them. The next question then asked if the student had a, a device. Again, we had about eight family members or eight students who did not have a device that we can reach out to and make sure we get them a district Chromebook. Within all of this then, we had some themes that seemed to pop up in the free response portions of the survey. Uh, first of all, there is an overwhelming amount of gratitude to how things were structured and then to the staff as well. Um, teachers have been working with families nonstop, answering emails, having small group Google Meets, large group Google Meets, creating all of the work and all the instruction almost overnight for, for families. So there is um, just an amazing amount of thank yous and your heroes and those kinds of things within the survey. Another piece that I think all families are trying to f figure out is that time management piece, especially families with multiple children, the parents are working from home, those kinds of things. So, so families um, didn't necessarily reach out for us to find a solution on that, but at times it was more of a, this is where we're at as a family and we're still trying to, to um, work on it and figure it out as well. 
which sometimes then when there's many people at home, it was hard to have the child focus. So that just comes with the territory when you have many people working from home. Um, but that's something that our staff will problem solve through and see if we can offer more ways for families to help their students focus at home, whether it's more live instruction at times. Um, so then family members don't have to work as hard with, especially their um, elementary students during the mornings and the day. And that goes along with the next bullet point there about more instructional videos and live teaching. Actually, the next two bullets there. And looking at more small group and individual check-ins as well as small groups. Sometimes our students are shy to talk in large groups. So making sure we offer those opportunities for them. So our next steps then, um, we are working on creating a checklist to um, follow up with families and next steps. These action steps will go to, first of all, the grade level teams, so they can look at the survey data as well. Principals, our tech department, where we focus on the Chromebook and access piece, and then our district staff will address many items as well. And then we have some bullet points there that I mentioned on the previous slide as well to start brainstorming on and see how we can tweak the system. Overall, I'd say our survey results were favorable. I was actually surprised to see how favorable they were. So we'll be tweaking as we move on and, and going forward. Well, this is uh, one way in which we try to get a dipstick, if you will, in terms of where our community is feeling. And can we just stop presenting, please hold. <clears throat> and I'd like to bring us back then to the question uh, with regard to obviously anything that's been shared with our board this evening, but also as importantly, um, the question of whether or not it's appropriate for us to just start to get the community's feedback on a potential, and I can't underscore the word potential enough, of, of seeing uh, where our staff and our community might feel about um, starting school a little bit early if we can if we can seek that waiver. So at this point, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Sarah, by the way, for your initiative and in putting together that wonderful uh, presentation and, and uh, certainly welcome uh, any insights that board members may have. This is Kimberly. I have a question, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I had the privilege of sitting in on the 4K directors meeting today. And they also surveyed their families about how things are going, right amount of content, right amount of support. And some parents had said that they could really uh, use some physical materials, everyday classroom supplies. Um, for the little grades, you know, K through two, you use a lot of construction paper, glue sticks, et cetera. And some of the assignments, you know, require that as well. Has there been any thought about maybe distributing some of that? I have not heard that yet from any families. Actually, that I don't believe I was going through the responses that even popped up in the free response portion of the survey, but that's something we can definitely support. We, we have the materials. So um, I actually meet with Nicole Teep on Thursday at 9 to talk through that a little bit more. She had she, she said that the 4K director meeting was today, and, and she had some insights. So I'm sure that's one of the insights she had. But that's maybe a piece then that we can move forward with K through 2 families as well with some of those hands-on pieces and see if if that's a need. Awesome, thank you. This is Leah, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, are we thinking of sending this out again at the end of this? Because we surveyed people on week one, so week one is definitely different, at least in our house. With week three versus week one, it's still different, and it's constantly changing. So I think surveying again at the end, to see that we still fall in the a good category or even halfway through might be a good idea. Yep, I agree. Um, we we wanted to get a little bit in. We, we sent it out last week. So we wanted to get a little bit into it, but we also needed the feedback to pivot. 
Um, so we waited till week two. Week one was a little hairy in my household too. So my answer changed from week one to week two already. So yeah, I agree. The most important thing we can do with that survey is use the results to inform our next actions. And so a uh, number of dipsticks that we'll be doing within our community just to make certain that the forage is just right. Uh, I'm grateful to, to Sarah for her leadership in that effort. Um, any thoughts or concerns about a recommendation to survey the community about a potential start to, uh, or at least requesting the, of the state, a uh, early start to the school year? Well, Steve, this is Rod. I think you're absolutely right um, to survey the community. Um, I, I think that we need to be thoughtful about um, um, allowing families to have the opportunity to spend time together in a different way. Uh, families um, will have by that time been through uh, a lot together and have spent time together in a very different way than they have before. And I think we need to be thoughtful about um, allowing families the time to uh, to do what they typically do in in August. Um, so I'm glad you're I'm glad you're taking a survey, and it'll be very interesting to to see the results. Um, I think this could be another thing. If there, I don't know um, in what way we were planning to survey the community, but especially going along um, with some of the social and kind of um, extracurricular things that students have lost during the school year as those restrictions are starting to go into the summer. It could be um, once we get closer to that end of the school year right now, uh, what we have planned, it could be um, when we have a better idea of where deadlines are going, important to ask students um, kind of how they would feel about it. Um, Obviously, going back to school later um, and being overwhelmed by your coursework isn't a better alternative. Um, but if social distancing goes out to, you know, two weeks before school starts, I think that some students may feel that they didn't have um, time to relax um, just because of all the things that are going on with everyone being cooped up at home. So that could be um, just to maybe differentiate a question for that um, could be helpful. My question would be, what capacity do we have to prepare for that, to make that time valuable? I mean, we don't, teachers don't just throw in more topics. They have to meet and decide how to use that time. So just keep, keep in mind there will need to be some planning before that. Yes, thank you for that. This is under the assumption that um we're at phase three of the governor's um back to back to um, work plan i'm not remembering the name of it as it just came out this afternoon but this would assume that we we're all back to where we were pre-march 16th and that we would um, likely try to have something whereby our teachers would continue to have a, a planning period planning time planning week so to speak um, similar to the model we did last year uh, you're right though we can't just uh, ask our teachers to to go right in and, and just just kick back right up again. Uh, we want to be very thoughtful about it. And, and one of the stakeholders that needs to survey into this, of course, is our, our faculty and staff. And Ali, thank you for your point. It's very well made. We have to remember there's a difference between being quarantined and working and relaxing versus being able to go out and experience uh, what we all remember summer to be, right? So thank you, thank you for that. Any other questions with regard to um, the uh, Badger uh, plan that was announced this afternoon or some of the other suggestions that were shared tonight? So I just wanted to say thank you to Sarah for putting together the survey. I really appreciate that um, um, reaching out to the families to find out how that's going. Um, I also really like the idea of having those individual or small group check-ins with kids because that's, um, I've, I've seen my own fifth grader on those Zoom, Zoom meetings and there's just a lot going on and there's a lot of kids and it can be really hard to have them all get a chance to really touch base and, and have an interaction with their teacher. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. One of the pieces that I, I failed to mention is um, we're looking to try to utilize our 
um, staff groups a little differently at the high school. Uh, we're planning on rolling out something uh, with our seniors first uh, and uh, be able to do just what Diana has mentioned here is just that personal touch uh, through staff and assuming that that works out well, uh, we'll try to, 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 uh, to roll it out into uh, even into the 9th through 11th grade. So please stay, stay uh, tuned. We'll have more information there. Thanks everybody for your feedback. Much appreciated. All right, we'll move on to 7B, Special Education Program Update. Uh, Mr. Johnson, do you want to introduce some of the people that we have here with us that are part of your um, team? Absolutely. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to kind of give an update on where we're at and where we're going. Um, and so we, one of the cool things that we've done this year um, is create kind of a leadership team. Um, so it was kind of created about mid-year. Um, just to kind of get support where we're at, where do we want to go, what are things you're dealing with in your buildings, how can we help kind of from a district level. Um, and so we have a few of those members here today um, and we're really excited about it. So Shannon Casterdale, special education teacher at our high school. Um, Alyssa Fight, special ed teacher at our middle school. And Casey Wittick, special ed teacher at the Intermediate Center and Caitlin Katzman, who is um, speech and language pathologist at our intermediate center as well. Um, and then we also have Jennifer Aney, who is program support teacher for our district. So I think that's our full crew um, who's, here, who's here today. So the, those, everyone here is kind of volunteered. We have a bigger leadership team. Um, um, and it's basically anybody who volunteered, the whole, all of the teachers um, were invited um, to be part of it, related services staff, um, and luckily this, this crew volunteered. So I'll, I'll talk more into that later. Um, we'll go into the PowerPoint. Yeah, so, so kind of the first thing um, to kind of bring it kind of back around where we've been in the journey where we're gonna continue to go would be what this is just my third year as being a director in the district um, and when i very first started um, probably within the first month on the job we had a gentleman come in and work with teachers our related services staff um, paraprofessionals were invited kind of the leaders of our whole district kind of in, in a lot of different components um, student services were involved um, as well what is our department? What is student services all about? Um, and this is kind of the poster that we came up with that day. I was very background in it. I was brand new. I just wanted to know what the staff in the buildings, what they felt their vision is as a team, and what are the three priorities that we need moving forward. As you can imagine, they had a lot more than just three priorities, um, but that was kind of a good indication of what was super important to them. So they came up with the vision, um, which was that we'll set high expectations for all students to achieve academic, social, and emotional competencies to become confident and productive members of society. And then we had, they had, they developed three main priorities. Staff will develop a universal curriculum by unpacking and prioritizing standards through collaborative work time and incorporating inclusive practices. Continue to develop um, our multi-tiered systems of support, RTI and PBIS framework, and then also provide staff opportunities to develop competencies to become confident leaders in the school. So as we kind of go about the presentation, it'll kind of go back to at least two of those priorities. The, the priority about the MTSS, uh, multi-tiered systems of support, is really more student services based or psychs or social workers. Um, and as we presented in, in some of our information advocacy reports, we, uh, we address that component a lot. So in general, um, we have 292 students with disabilities, 13.1% um, um, within our district, and we serve students in every disability category. Um, so we have students with autism, EBD, hearing impairments, intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, other health impaired, um, orthopedic impairment, 
um, significantly developmentally delayed speech and language and vision. So those are kind of our categories and we have staff and students um, who are helping support in every one of those areas. We have a continuum of services within the district as well. So instruction looks different within each grade. We're meeting the needs of kids. So every kid has an individualized education plan and it's specific to the individual student. Most of our buildings are cross categorical, um, but some are not. You'll see that in the next slide. Um, and every kind of grade, which is just the way we do instruction, it's a little bit different within each building. So um, some buildings are grade level specific and some do more of a looping approach. So they might take a student in kindergarten and move to, they'll follow the students from first and second grade. In third, fourth, and fifth grade, when a um, case manager starts with students in third grade, they keep them to fourth and then they keep them to fifth. Um, so it looks a little bit different within each building. So here is kind of a list of our staff um, that we have doing the work in each of the buildings. Um, and this is kind of the opportunity where I want um, each of the teachers to kind of talk about the work that they're doing um, within their building. What does it look like and how are you moving practices forward? So if Casey um, Wittick, if you want to start with what do our services look like at the IC? Um, good evening, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you get, for giving me the chance to share about the great things happening at the IC. Um, like Brian said, I'm a third grade special education teacher at the IC. Um, three of us at the IC are currently in the looping position, so we will stay with our students that we have um, for the next three years. Um, we currently are um, providing literacy, math, social skills, and self-regulation self interventions to students, um, really working on getting those foundational skills down so that they can be successful with the general education curriculum. Um, and then we also hired an additional special ed teacher this year um, who is actually doing all-inclusive practices for both literacy and math at the, fifth, the fourth and fifth grade level. And moving forward next year, we, um, all the special education teachers in our building will be co-teaching math using our new math curriculum bridges for next year. So, so it's pretty exciting. So. Okay. Great, thanks Casey. Um, how about Alyssa at the middle school? Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, this is the first board meeting of any kind I've ever been to, so I'm nervous, but um, <laughs> so I um, at, teach eighth grade special ed um, at the middle school right now. Um, we are doing it, um, we have two special ed teachers per grade level right now and divide caseloads in that way. Um, we, um, there's a lot of overlap um, because even though we're in different wings, we still support each other a lot just in the day to day. So um, especially if there's like crisis situations with kids, um, you know, we'll support from different grade levels just to be another person there. Um, we have, um, I've taken a big step, I think, this year in really trying to dive into co-teaching. Um, it's been a big adjustment. Um, we've had some staff turnover too, and that's made it some challenging in some ways, but easier in others because then there's a fresh face willing to take on some new things sometimes. Um, but we've started with language arts at the middle school um, just because I found it's easier to get an idea of what that looks like with multiple kids with different abilities um, in that because I can provide um, everything auditorily if I need to if it's a reading disability. Um, so we're um, looking at co-teaching in the math, but it just looks different. It's more small group um, instruction during work time. Um, so it's just not quite as smooth as it is, but um, it's been an adjustment and trying to do it virtually is even another adjustment. Um, so I don't know, I think that's been the biggest thing right now is how to best serve kids um, with their peers as much as possible these days. Thanks, Alyssa. How about Shannon at the high school? Hi, um, I'm Shannon Castardale. Um, I work primarily with 11th graders um, at the high school of a cross categorical caseload. Um, we are switching now to a looping model. So we, um, we would have students for four years. 
um, which would really build those um, relationships with students um, and being able to hit the ground running each year um, with implementing IEPs and um, services. Um, we have tipped our, we've dipped our toe in the water of teaching. Um, I've been working with two math teachers, Algebra A, or excuse me, Algebra B and Algebra 1. And um, we also have a special educator working um, with the English department. Um, and it's a, it's a work in progress and there's a, some learning curve with it, but I think um, as we progress um, and we learn um, how to do, you know, improve our craft, um, we'll continue to um, make this process uh, smoother. Um, but I think we want to really shift our role from like a helper and coping teacher role to more of a learning strategist role um, where we're really building those collaborative relationships with the gen ed teachers so that we're able to have more of a proactive stance with students um, to be more impactful um, so that they're able to um, you know, build those reading skills or writing skills or whatever the skill area is and to um, really provide that access to equitable education as well, like reducing barriers or, you know, working in that team um, model can really, um, I think, bring forth just really great outcomes for our students. Um, so I'm excited with the direction that we're going. Um, like I said, it's a work in progress and I really think that we have like momentum and we just, you know, as a leadership team, we talk about how we can continue moving forward to make those, um, that shift our role is as special educators in our buildings. Thanks. Thanks so much, Shannon. That, that was that was a great kind of summary from all three teachers. And um, really, you can see from, you know, the, the staff that we have, you know, the, the three people who just spoke are real true leaders um, doing the work. Um, constantly to help kids and and kids are the focus um, really wrapping around how can we take down the barriers exactly what what was just said and continue to have kids learn so so we're working and and with their special education teachers too we have a lot of related services and some staff are directly hired through within our district so we have four speech and language pathologists that are full-time within our district um, and then we have some part-time employees, so like Tina Steiner and Carly um, Powers for OT and PT um, are part-time within our district. Um, and then kind of on the other side of the screen for related services, we have um, staff that are um, hired through companies. So we, do, we don't have enough students to have our own staff, but we, they're just enough that we go through a company and then they bring in their services. So that would be vision services, orientation and mobility. Um, so what that looks like is if you have a student who's blind, how do they cross the street? How do they walk through the hallways with their cane? Um, they're working on both of those skills. And vision services are are more braille? How do you um, access education if you have a vision impairment? Um, and then we go through CESA 5 for um, deaf and hard of hearing. We also have an audiologist. We had a sign language interpreter um, at the moment. We do not have that service any longer. Um, and then we also have a, a great um, advocate within our district, Sharon Hammer. Um, Sharon is an autism slash behavioral consultant and trainer. She comes to the district once a month. Um, sometimes, specifically this year, she's come a lot more um, to help where needed. And she's just a resource for teachers. So if she'll come into classrooms, observe, um, and then take notes and then meet with teachers afterwards and, and problem solve, how, how can I help you? Um, how can I help build um, visual models for you or show you how to do this or you know what just a wealth of knowledge to be able to help support so kind of has helped in the autism role but really kind of transition um, from the behavioral role as well so Caitlin is here as well um, so Caitlin do you want to kind of talk about what you do from a speech and language service pathologist the services you provide and how that kind of looks like and how you're hoping to move forward Sure. Like Brian said, we're speech and language pathologists in our district, um, and each of us have a home base. Mine is right now at the IC, but we do split um, 
the roles of supporting 4K in the high school. Um, our job as speech language pathologists is to help our students increase their ability to communicate. And we do that as a primary service. So sometimes students only have speech language services, so we case manage their needs. And sometimes we're a related service and we support um, their needs through working with the special education teachers. Um, one of the things that we, or some of the things that we do is we work on increasing intelligibility, we work with children who might be nonverbal and need alternative um, means to communicate. We work on just increasing students' abilities to understand language and use language within the classroom. Um, we work with students who have fluency disorders. Um, we do social skills groups with kids who might be on the spectrum or who have any kind of social needs. Um, and then we also work on voice. So we have kind of a wide range of things that we get to do with kids, which makes our job really um, fun and exciting from day to day, which is great. Um, and thinking about where we are now and where we're moving forward, we as a team have also been talking about how we can support kids best in the classroom. And that does look different at all different grade levels. I know um, Emily McCaffrey is our speech pathologist who works with the younger kids, and she works a lot with Kim Van Weeps, and so they are doing a lot of work in the preschools and 4Ks and trying to um, brainstorm how they can be in those classrooms more. Um, Linda Carlson is um, mostly at the primary center, and I know she has been teaming with regular ed and special ed in with that cohort of students who was our first year to do full inclusive services. So she is in the classroom a lot supporting those students. Um, and next year, I'm hoping to, or our plan is, I'll be teaming with Casey Wittick, and we will both be supporting a fourth grade classroom. So I'll be supporting the literacy side of it, and she'll be supporting the math side, um, just to really make sure that we are meeting kids where they're at and helping them with the things that they really need. Um, as kids get older, their services look a little bit different. So Maddie Braun, who is housed at the middle school, um, students tend to need more consultative services rather than direct services at those that age. She does still support students um, and all their needs, and she does do inclusion where appropriate. And at other times, she supports the teachers um, in the decisions that they make. So that's kind of our plan for um, moving forward in the next year. Great, thanks so much, Caitlin. Caitlin is new to our district this year um, and already having a tremendous impact on kids and families. And so we, we're just really fortunate that she's part of our team and, uh, and, and helping, helping us, us move forward and, and do the right thing for kids. Um, I just have a, I wanted to just show a couple of components on here is, is more of just to kind of let you know, special ed teachers might not even realize all of this stuff happens too behind the scenes. Um, but we as a district are always looked at um, for monitoring from DPI from a state and federal level on 20 indicators. So these are the indicators that um, DPI puts in, um, in high regard. Um, and so the actual, the title, if you want to learn more about it, is an active link so you could get into the monitoring cycle. Um, ultimately, on a cycle, we're reviewed on some of the components. Some are reviewed every year and some are just reviewed as you might need it. So um, indicator 11 was one of the components that we were reviewed on this year um, as well as parent involvement is another one although that's been put on hold because of COVID-19 um, and so those specifically then will get looked at DPI will ask us for a whole bunch of data we'll send it in um, and then they'll let us know if we're approved or if we need corrections or if if we're in non-compliance um, we at this moment are 100% in compliance with everything where we're at. Um, and then you have indicators like 16, 17, 18, and 19 are dispute resolution. So luckily we've never had a, since I've been here, um, <laughs> we have never had a formal um, DPI complaint against the district. Um, and in that we, we haven't lost a complaint. So if we would lose it, then you'd have a corrective action and then you'd be in uh, indicator review um, and then you'd, you'd need to make some changes. So um, that's where kind of we're at. Next year is a big year for a district. Teachers have heard this multiple times. Um, the IEPs that we write 
are going to be reviewed next year for compliance. So next year is what they call a self-assessment year. Um, it happens every five years from a special ed perspective. And then um, a DPI will say, number all the students you have within your district, and then they'll tell you pick numbers one, eight, nine, ten, and then they'll pick about 30 students. You'll have to pull all of those files they'll send you a packet of information and then you'll go through and then we mark ourselves compliant or not compliant for all of the categories. Um, and then we make corrections and then we do professional development on what to fix where we're at. Um, it's expected that there, you're not going to be a hundred percent compliant ever. That, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Um, when I used to work at DPI, um, I know that the districts that said you had 100% um, compliance, you actually were looked at more closely than the districts who said we had five errors, right? You, you need to be in a kind of that middle spot where maybe there's a couple errors and then you'll make corrections and fix them. Um, but you don't want to be in a position where um, you're at a 40 errors and it, it, you're correcting all of this data because that, that becomes embarrassing too. So. So that's kind of where we're at and where we're going. Um, one of the things that we've implemented and Jennifer has kind of helped a lot on is our process and procedures for IEPs. And so this is just one student example of all of the data we keep for every single student. So this student um, is in 12th grade, Diane Cook's the case manager. Um, we have the meeting date, when the IEP start dates, and then the IEP end date. Um, we have Mara would send the invite out if she needed to do that. And then once the IEP is completed, it goes to Jennifer for a review. She initials that she reviewed it. Then it goes back to the special ed teacher to make corrections. Then it gets reviewed again, and then it's considered in kind of final state. Once I see it there, then I do a final review approve it, then I date it and initial it, and then Mara um, sends it out, and then we, we mark that down as well. So we have all of the clear dates, timelines, when everything was done, and kept track. So Jennifer, I don't know if you want to say anything further. We do the same thing for evaluations um, and all of kind of the compliance pieces. So welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this has been a, a good addition to help us keep track of um, those timelines. And uh, there's a, a Google Doc that I use to review all of the IEPs and the evaluations that align with all of the IEP parts or, or pieces. And so um, I think there's been a lot of improvement um, over the, the years. We've uh, outlined some of the procedures and processes. And then um, we've kind of shared in a shared drive that was created what that process looks like for meeting the different timelines too. So it's been a good, good addition. Sounds great. So then when we look at priorities, um, you know, the, for special ed really, we've had a shift of instructional practices. Um, we've had an increase in inclusive practices. And then kind of in student services realm, we've had an increased focus on mental health and wellness, um, social emotional learning and kind of resilience. Another priority that we have that we're gonna continue to work on is really our transition. Um, we have an incredible transition teacher, uh, Mary McDonald Sutter, um, who runs a great 18 to 21 year old program. Um, as Shannon talked about earlier today, right, we're really going to talk about looping kids at the high school. And so we have a better relationship and a stronger relationship with kids throughout their whole high school career. But that also means that we can start developing transition earlier. And what does that look like? And it can be a continuous process because if transition starts at 18, we're way too late. Transition needs to start at eighth grade, 14, when Alyssa's grade about starting to have those conversations, having them start to go to some of the nights that we're running and Jennifer's done a great job putting on this year. Um, and so those are things that we're kind of continuing to look at. So 
A couple of areas that we've done to look at that is we've developed a leadership team, all volunteer. Um, we're doing a book read, um, and then that kind of gets us started to talk about where we're at, where we can continue to look forward. Um, we're going to do a curricular review, looking at the re, um, curriculum we're using, and is it consistent and build across the grade levels? Just an opportunity to share across different grades and different buildings. Um, and then also professional learning opportunities, and that we'll get into more the, the next slide. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about training and where we can help support um, throughout the building. And so I'm gonna let Jennifer talk about that. Um, but then also providing training. Um, we do month, I do monthly meetings with every building, um, as some PD, but more like how can I help and wh where are we at? Um, we've done a focus on trauma-informed care. Um, and then Molly Varick, um, does co-teaching training at our K through five, four K through five buildings. Um, and then Peggy Black does our six through 12 buildings. So she does a lot of, she does some upfront professional development, but then she also does um, going into the building, checking out what you're doing and then helping to provide feedback as well. So Jennifer, I'll let you take the next couple slides really talking about the survey that was developed and you know, kind of the great work that, that we're doing and you've really taken on um, about paraprofessionals. Okay. Um, yeah, the leadership committee, when we um, initially met, we decided to put together two surveys, one for the paraprofessionals and then one for our um, special education teachers too. Um, the paraprofessional survey really showed that um, the main areas that our paras are looking for more training and support in are that trauma-informed care piece, as well as working with students with autism. And then on the next slide, um, we had another real specific question about behaviors, like how could we support you in dealing with challenging behaviors more? And um, emotional regulation came as, out as the area of greatest need. They would like to understand better um, the emotional regulation piece, as well as positive behavior intervention supports, and the nonviolent crisis intervention. And so, um, it just kind of happened in March that I was able to work with the high school paraeducators and do some training um, on the ACT day, which uh, was really received well by the, the high school staff. And then um, given our current circumstances, um, it just really has worked out nicely that I've been able to do some training now virtually with both the elementary paraprofessionals and then the secondary paraprofessionals. And we really focused on um, initially the first couple of weeks, what does providing support look like in an online virtual learning world? And then um, we did a little bit of um, autism in there. And then we spent a lot of time on trauma-informed care last week, completing those modules. And then now the rest of the, the couple of weeks that we have, um, Moving forward, we'll be talking about different topics in autism each week. And it's been a really good experience. I think it gives um, the paras a chance to really think about their students and voice um, what they're observing of their students, hearing what other paras are experiencing, and using each other as kind of that sounding board, getting ideas. Um, it's been a really a positive, positive experience, I think, for, for all the paras and myself as well. So these are some of the, the specific trainings that we've provided um, for paraprofessionals this year, um, different folks who've provided it. Um, and then we've also included all of the paraprofessionals in optional wise, our district wide trainings. Um, that hasn't always been done. Um, but so some of our crisis response, some of the trauma pieces, uh, they've all been, been welcome to attend those as well as optional. So one more, 
would be our next steps. So we're moving towards a full continuum of services models. So we are not a district who's moving, like we're not gonna be fully inclusive um, because it needs to look different and meet the needs of kids. And so we just want co-teaching to be a strong and viable option as well on that model, but we're really looking at meeting kids where they're at and where they really need to be successful. It's not saying that co-teaching is more important than pull-out, but it's really about having options to meet the needs of kids where they're at and, and how we can help support kids. Um, continuing training for paraprofessionals. And when we get new paraprofessionals within our district, having an onboarding process so that they can feel successful from the very beginning, um, not learning just, you know, kind of being thrown in and learning as you go. Um, something that is important is parent outreach. Um, as we go through um, the DPI look at parent um, supports, that's one of the questions and kind of really getting into it is, is what do parents need more from us from? Um, and then focusing on our mind priorities, continuing to develop and, and work on the great work that the teachers are doing on the leadership team. We'll update the five-year plan after we get there. Um, and then, like we talked about earlier, focus on transition planning for being 14 all the way up. Um, and, you know, another kudos to Jennifer and our high school staff and, and eighth grade teachers to um, really have done two incredible transition nights this year. Um, I've gotten a ton of great feedback from parents on those. Um, you know, really talking about jobs and internships and how to start that process now. So everything's changed recently um, <laughs> with COVID-19. Um, what ended up happening in, in kind of um, very general terms is that we, I sent a note to all families that said prior written, it was a prior written notice letter um, that basically said things are about to change. Um, we are going to continue to move forward um, the goal is going to be focusing on student goals and continuing to make sure that they're making progress towards those goals. Um, and then we've developed all of the teachers and related arts staff and, and student services providers have developed alternative learning considerations forms um, that have kind of said what services will look like during virtual learning and what will not be able to continue to be given during this time frame, and very few things are not. Um, because the U.S. Department of Ed and DPI has said that we're not really looking at minutes, we're looking at services. So it's not that a paraprofessional is working with a student for 120 minutes a day, it's that our, what was the goal of that paraprofessional during that time and how are they going to continue to meet that, that goal? So what's that service? Um, so those are continuing to be met. And then ultimately, there's some kids that are not going to be able to access student learning through this format. We're, it's just not going to, it's not going to be a, meet their needs. Um, and so the nice thing is, is that when this all happened, we were coming up right to third quarter. And so we'd done a lot of looking at current goals. Um, I had a little bit of a heads up that like something might happen. And so the Monday before we closed, I, I was having a meeting with all the speech and language pathologists. And at that point, I thought I was being incredibly proactive um, and said like thinking 20 steps ahead, if we would happen to have to close, think about how your needs would move forward and sent a, an email to everybody saying, make sure we have data about where kids are at right now. So if we have to go back, um, what what U.S. Department of Ed and DPI has said is that we'll need to consider compensatory services for kids who can't access learning during this time. Um, and so that will be incredibly important. What's their baseline? Where are they at when we come back? And then what do we have to do to catch them up at that point? So I think that that's all. Any questions that you have? I, I know that was a kind of long. There's a lot of components to special ed. Um, uh, questions that you have for the entire team?
not hearing any Brian, you know, it seems to me that you've assembled the all-star band uh, as part of your leadership team. And each of them in their own right just has so much love and care for our kids. But there are also uh, people who have a great deal of cachet with the rest of our faculty and staff. So when they offer ideas and suggestions and demonstrate leadership, it's well received. So thank you to each one of you for the outstanding efforts you're making, uh, especially that which goes unnoticed. Uh, much, much appreciated. Uh, I'm eager to see how it continues to, to grow on behalf of our students and families. Well done. Yeah, thank you yeah. all for the We appreciate the presentation and, and the, the insights you've shared. Does that make Thanks. you a lead singer? If it's an all-star band, Brian, does that make you a lead singer? And if so, could you give us a little right now? <laughs> I will not sing. That will that will that will just ruin the whole. Th You'll forget everything we just said. <laughs> but I will also reiterate. You know, we we the best thing about Mount Horeb is the people, um, and and that you know couldn't be said enough. I I'm so excited to work with the teachers that we have, who are thoughtful and honest and aren't just saying yes to say yes, but are really thinking it through and pushing in the right directions. And really the focus is on students and what can we do to make students learn and get better. And, and I'm, I'm really lucky to, to be here and, and be part of this team. So thank you all. Thanks, Brian. All right, we move on to 7C, Information and Advocacy Report, Progress on District's Long Range Facilities Plan and Annual Capital Improvement and Maintenance Report. That's a long name. Thanks, Dave, for being here with us and, and walking through this with us. I see there are several attachments in our board docs for this. Well, good evening, everyone. This is Scott here. Can everybody hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome, <laughs> thanks Steve. Well, good evening everyone. Um, first, I just wanna say thank you. Um, over the last couple of years, we've made incredible strides on our facility planning and our facility improvements. And um, we couldn't have done it without all of our committees and our board meetings, the support from our community and of course the people that are in the district each day managing all of the projects. So um, you may recall a, a few years ago, we started a range facility study. The documents that you have in front of you, um, we label them A, a B, C, and D. And Steve, we'll start with letter A. Um, these documents may look familiar to you. These are documents that we created a couple years ago with you to start documenting not only what are the, the facility needs, but also to be able to update that each April um, to reflect all of the improvements that we've been able to make. And of course, we've made a lot of them over the last couple of years, again, thanks to the support of the board and the community. And so um, the first document that Steve has up here um, is our long range facility analysis. And again, you may recall this is a document where we're taking eight significant areas of each one of our buildings. And we have seven of them total, including the bus garage and the district office. And we assign them a letter grade based on where they're at. Um, the one thing I do wanna mention is we did upgrade the letter grades to um, reflect the projects that are gonna be going on this spring and summer um, to finish out the referendum. And so while some of these things, such as the intermediate center roof has not been done yet, we've updated the grade to reflect that project, knowing that that work will be done here um, fairly soon. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave in just a second, but one thing I just wanna point out is in general, if you take a look at the 2020 column, you'll see that the primary center, the intermediate center, the middle school, and the high school, as you know, reflect a lot of the work that's been done 
not only the last two years, both in the operating budget, but also through the referendum projects. Um, but it also reflects the projects that are, again, that are going to be going on this coming spring and summer. And so then you'll see the two sort of outliers right now in that whole list has to do with the, um, the early learning center and then the district office. I think I left out the bus garage in my previous um, description, but as you'll see the bus garage, that project took place back in 2007. Um, we're standing good there. So in terms of overall, um, again, early learning center and the district office are where the more of the significant needs are right now. Um, with that said, Dave, I'll turn it over to you. If you want to point anything out in particular, you're more than welcome to. Thank you, Scott. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Scott said, uh, we developed this uh, report card, so to speak, a couple years ago to kind of get a uh, handle on where we thought each particular uh, building was in those eight uh, areas. And those areas all include, they, they typically are, are things I can't fit into my, my local yearly uh, budget. Um, so replacing a roof is certainly nothing I can, I can afford to do out of my budget and requires a referendum. Um, some of the other things, yeah, I could pick away at, but, um, for the most part, these are the, these are the, the big ticket items, so to speak. So and as Scott said, based on the, um, the work that we've done, um, over the last, you know, you could say maybe 10 years, um, of, you know, the IC getting built, the, the PC getting remodeled, the uh, bus garage being built. Uh, the renovations at the high school were in good shape on a lot of our buildings. Um, we do have a couple question marks, a couple um, outliers, so to speak. The uh, early learning center uh, does have some needs. It's good in some regards. It's um, sorely lacking in others, uh, most notably the roof. Um, you know, but for a, a building of 1967 vintage, it's still pretty solid. Uh, it's got new windows and doors. It's got a new roof over the center section. Um, the boilers are fairly new. Um, there is some flooring, but it, again, it, it's 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 certainly the one that we need the most attention to as soon as we get a direction on that. And then the other the other problem child, so to speak, is the uh, district office. What to do with that? Um, it has a, a, a number of significant needs. Uh, we did put a roof on it to kind of uh, stem the tide of leaking that we had uh, potentially going on there. But uh, the envelope needs new windows and doors. Um, the HVAC needs some uh, attention. The flooring certainly needs some attention. Um, so that, that's, that was the, the, the intent of this particular document is to kind of give you, a, at a glance, this is where those buildings lie. One of the things I, I just want to mention, and, and I know we've talked about it in previous years relating to this particular document, you know, as Dave mentioned, it, it addresses eight major components of each one of our buildings. What it doesn't do is it doesn't take into account things like capacity. You know, obviously some of the work, a lot of the work that we did at the high school provided a lot more capacity and opportunities for kids. Um, obviously, in this document, we don't give a letter grade to capacity. Capacity, obviously, is dependent on not only what's going on with student enrollment trends, but then also what's going on in the curricular area. So, you know, again, not to be narrow focused, but um, doesn't address capacity issues. You know, I look at the folks in the district office on my computer screen tonight, and it reminds me just, you know, how close quarters things are with some of the meetings and things that we have from time to time. So I just wanted to point out the capacity piece on this. I, um, questions or thoughts or comments on letter A, the long range facility analysis. Thanks for listening on this one. Thanks. I have a question. Um, how do you determine um, the lifespan of some of these things? Is this average lifespan for buildings, components? 
I can I can answer that. Um, there are um, for a roof, it's guaranteed. They, we have warranties. And I kind of uh, base the lifespan of a roof uh, based on its warranty. Now, in the in the uh, case of the ELC, obviously the warranty on that roof has run out 25, 30 years ago. But um, the point is, is that you know it, once you, once you get out past the the warranty time frame on a roof, you should start thinking about re replacing it. Other other componentry, um, there are some guidelines when it comes to um, how long those things last. So we were able to find some information on the internet that said, you know, you can expect your um, an HVAC system to last X amount of years on average. Um, how many years does it have, uh, would a, your electrical system go before it needs some upgrading, uh, things like that. So that's, that's basically where those numbers come from. Did that answer the question? Okay, if you'd be so kind, let's take a look at um, letter B. Thank you, Steve. The letter is a facility operation and maintenance plan. So what this is, is um, Dave alluded to in the first document that those are some pretty large ticket items that are really, and so this document, letter B, um, addresses preliminary plan for how Dave would, would um, operating dollars over the next three years, starting with the 2021 school year. And of course, as you know, things are subject to change because things pop up from time to time that were unexpected. And sometimes Dave finds himself having to reallocate dollars to other kinds of things. Nevertheless, um, Typically, each year we budget for $130,000 in Dave's operating budget. Now, of course, those things don't include utilities like heat and electricity and snow removal and personnel and all those kinds of things. So this is um, specific to various smaller projects that Dave would envision needing to accomplish here over the next three years. Again, it's a snapshot in time. Um, there's time and talk about how we need to reallocate because something else has come up. And so um, it was Dave's opportunity to be able to categorize dollar priorities based on each one of our buildings and some things that he could try to accomplish within the 130,000. Right, so as, as Scott said, this is kind of my, my three-year vision of what things that I would like to work on. Um, there are um, augmentations to the, to the buildings, not necessarily uh, repairs. There are, like you could say, at the, athletic, at the athletic fields, one of the things that is um, I would love to do is to put a soccer light control upgrade. Um, turning the lights on and off at the soccer stadium are kind of... Um, well, they're not like I, I would like them to be. So to have that upgraded, now is that a, is that a super priority? Well, it depends. But you know, like Scott said, also um, we could have a boiler go down or a, a AC compressor go down that would kick that uh, that project down the road for a couple of years. So again, this is kind of my vision of what things I would attack um, if no other surprises were to come my way. Now, letter C and D, doc, so we look at the three years, which was the document we were just looking at um, regarding Dave's operations. Um, going long term, years four through seven, which is document C, and years eight through 12, which is document D. These two documents really address not only some operational pieces, but it really gets into some major component kinds of things. In other words, um, you may recall last year, our long range data, again, documents C and D last year, showed the intermediate center growth. 
And so in other words, if we were not able to accomplish the intermediate center roof replacement through the referendum, what would we need to do over the next 10, 12, 13 years to accomplish getting a new roof at the intermediate center? Now, this doesn't necessarily mean practically speaking that we would be able to accomplish these things in an operating budget because again, $130,000 a long ways when we're talking about some big ticket items but nevertheless we don't want to ignore the fact that that need is there and so it's important for us to recognize for example i look at the early learning center at the top of the document that's on your screen you'll see that if we started putting fifty thousand dollars away starting in 23 24 how long would it take for us to get to an approximate seven hundred fifty thousand dollar Um, mostly a um, document D where we'd be able to recover that much money. Um, but again, the point is that for us to one, be able to recognize where some of our needs are, and then two, if those needs are met in some other financing capacity, how we would need to try to fit some of these things in our operating. Um, and the one challenge, as all of you know, is forecasting public financing and what our funding will look like. And as you've seen, every time there's a referendum um, in the district, it's either relating to operations and many times over it has to do with um, long range facility planning and doing improvements. And so, again, we all know we're fortunate and we have such a strong supportive community. Um, nevertheless, um, if we didn't have financing opportunities down the road, these are some things we'd have to figure out how to tackle. Any questions? I have a question. Um, so looking at the years one to three, looking at 2020 to 2021, are, is this something where, are these dollars we're planning on putting away, is that what we're, we're saying with this plan, is that these dollars for 2020, 2021 will be put away for the future, or those are things we're doing that year? These, great question. Um, the first three years that um, letter B document has to do with dollars that we would be expending out of a regular operating budget to take care of some things. Years four through 12 have to do with more long-term, long-range, more bigger ticket items. Yeah, sorry. We're not planning on putting dollars away until starting in 2024. 2024. <clears throat> Correct. Which is basically what we've done the last couple of years. We haven't put dollars away, so no, I've done that. The dollars that we're in, but it's not like we're taking an entire two hundred thousand dollars that's operating budget. It's just it's significantly more than what Dave currently has in his operating. Budget. So again, nothing different than we've done in the past, but certainly updating the document to reflect what the cost could look like in our operating budget if there's no other financing involved in which to do it. Other questions? Well, this is
this is one of our favorite reports every year because it kind of gives us a, a, a feel for the work that has been done and allows us to kind of envision where we want to go in the future, especially around a potential long range facility planning committee that could hopefully try to come together at some point uh, post COVID-19 world. I think there's some significant discussion that needs to occur based upon the information you provided and that committee could likely help us do an even deeper dive, couldn't it? Uh, in determining what, what might be part of something we could share with our community uh, down the road. But suffice to say right now, uh, thanks to the community, thanks to our board, and thanks to you two for helping position us so favorably uh, from our brick and mortar side of the house. I, I, I know I speak for everyone here when I say thank you. Thanks, Scott and Dave. Scott, I'm sorry I didn't uh, um, announce you in the very beginning. I just, you were all the way at the bottom of the screen and I saw Dave. I haven't seen Dave in forever. I can't remember the last time I saw Dave. So it's really nice to see you guys on here tonight um, to get this report. Thanks so much for putting it together and updating it. <laughs> Our pleasure. All right. We can move on to eight action items. 8A is consider the purchase of budgeted Chromebooks referred from the Education Committee. Yes, board members, we're pleased to, to tell you that we think we have a lock in on uh, 212 Chromebooks, which are becoming increasingly more difficult to get due just to production issues that are coming from um, Asia. And so we're asking uh, for the board's consideration for us to use the dollars we currently have budgeted uh, for the purchase of these additional Chromebooks. So moved. Motion by Jeff, seconded by Danny. Further Second. discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 First reading, uh, first one is our graduation policy, 345.6. Hi, Sarah. This was some work that was done out of the Education Committee, uh, and I know that there were four board members present in that discussion, but sure would welcome maybe the Reader's Digest version of the good work being done on this uh, proposed uh, policy change. Yes, we are in year two of a uh, financial literacy pilot class, and we thought it was time to review the amount of students who are, are participating in that class, as well as another personal financial literacy um, class that we have, which is senior survival. The majority of the, the school districts in the area have a personal financial literacy graduation requirement. And when we looked at the Badger Conference, we were one of the few schools that did not have that requirement yet. Currently, we have about 65% of our students who are taking either senior survival or that, <clears throat> excuse me, that pilot personal finance class. Um, so FTE-wise, it wouldn't necessarily be a drain on our staffing, as well as this, the uh, class that we're piloting right now is shared between three departments. Um, social studies, business, and family consumer science. So we have the um, FTE that it's cost neutral there. Um, we believe it's a good thing for students to have before they leave Mount Horeb High School. And we um, had a really good discussion at the education committee about it. So in light of that, we had a motion to bring this to the full board for discussion. And that's why we have this new policy for you to look at today. This is we have motion to approve. Second. 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 Motion by Leah, seconded by Jeff. Um, can I make a one clarification on the policy? Sorry, let me pull up the so the little asterisk is after that personal financial literacy. Is is that meant to correspond? <laughs> graduation requirements starting with the class of 2025 thank you yes we'll put that asterisk there yep Sarah can you can you tell me about that last paragraph in B 
I can't remember. I can't remember talking about it, and I can't translate it. The minimum passing grade paragraph. Yeah. That par that paragraph um, is an established paragraph that's been there in the past. Let me just read it real quick, Damon, as well. The, the, in order for a student to receive the credit, they would need to pass the course. Is that the paragraph that you're wondering the content for? Yeah, I just I'm having trouble with constitutes. What's constituting what in that paragraph? A minimum passing grade constitutes the credit, therefore, they're eligible for graduation per 24 credits. That's how I read that current language. Does anyone read that differently? Yes, but I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah, we never touched that language. Yeah. It was my my worry yeah. my question about it is does that mean that staff decide what a minimum passing grade is and i might decide a minimum passing grade in my class is a d but someone else might say no you have to get a c to get this credit I see it more globally, um, whereas we have a, a, a grading scale within the high school, which we will we'll talk about that in, in a future date as well. At some point, I'm guessing we talk about assessment and grading, but we do have a, a global scale that's used, so it's not arbitrarily chosen. And then, yes, staff do look at their assessments and they do look at proficiency with grading. So that's where that instructional staff piece comes in because the students do earn grades, but the staff also work with students for those grades. So I see it as a more global statement, but. With all due respect to attorneys, um, it kind of seems like a, a really um, verbose way of saying uh, you get the credit if you pass the class. Is really what that paragraph should say. Um, I, I, if it's I appreciate the question, Damon, because you're right, you almost have to read it two or three times in order to make certain we fully understand it. If that's not um, the intent, you know, that's the beauty of this. It's it's a draft, and we, we certainly could propose um, something that would just reflect what we we think we know what it, what it means, uh, if that would be amenable to the, to the team. I, for me, it's not enough reason to hold it up if the intent is clear. I just apologize for not noticing that previously me too yeah I don't know. there is a motion yes sorry are we on mute i wasn't sure um so there's a motion uh by leah seconded by jeff any further discussion? I, I think when I read it again, it says to me that the minimum passing grade means the staff member can't come back and say, no, your grade's not high enough, I can't recommend you. Like Steve said, if you get the minimum passing grade, that's it, it counts. So I think I'm I'm okay with it. Okay. So we have a motion by Leah, seconded by Jeff. Further discussion? We will do, so I just wanna get all the people up. Um, a roll call vote, uh, Damon? Yes. Danny? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kimberly? She's a yes um, recorded on uh, chat. Looks like her microphone isn't playing nice with us. Oh, thank you. Uh, Leah? Yes. Rod? Yes. And I'm also a yes. Is that all of us? 
Yes. Um, all right, this policy is passed. And we'll move on to the second one, release time for religious instruction, policy 434.1, referred by the Education Committee. Hi, Sarah, can you lead us through the thinking behind this policy, please? Yes, uh, we, we're actually looking at three policies um, that circle around uh, religion in the classroom or in their schools. And the policy that's coming before the board tonight is the release time for religious instruction. As we, uh, we have a very short policy currently on the books, and as we were going through, and as I was going through um, any updates needed, uh, we came across some more specific language per statute and per um, our WASB review. So I just wanted to include the more specific language related to this policy. I have questions, lots of questions. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, so so it says, okay, that they have to have written permission, parent and guardian, and then, but it doesn't say who, like, who do they turn that into? And then the next part talks about we have to keep records, which seems more like policy or procedure than the policy. Then it talks about the board may deny release time. So are, are the, they asking permission from the board? I, I don't under, I'm very confused by this policy. So you touched on the procedure piece and that's where that med reg could come in. Um, as far as the last sentence of the second paragraph, you alluded to last Leah. Um, looking at that release time. I'm just reading over again. We could change that language if you don't want that language there. We could, um, in the end, it's a board policy where you're allowing that release time, um, but it's the administrators who are enforcing it. So, we can make a change in that. Um, I, I'm trying to think back in memory if I pulled that specifically from statute, but I can go back and look at that if you'd like. Yeah, I, I can it. speak. Oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. I, no, having, go ahead. Having had students do this, it really is a three-part process. Um, when they're absent, Infinite Campus records it as um, a religious excuse. So you, so you can track it on our end, what they're gone for. So that's the first part. And then the second part is kind of an accountability piece that the school would expect the instructor to verify that the kids are actually going there for the instruction. Now, I don't know if the schools have to do that, but it's set as an expectation. <clears throat> and so then the third piece is hey, we've been excusing you, but your instructor says you're not going, we're not gonna excuse you anymore. So in reality, that's how it, well, in other schools that I've been in, that's how it works. That doesn't mean that's the way we have to do it. That's just how it's written. Does that make sense? That That's very helpful, thank you. And then as a board, you have the student uh, student attendance enforcement policy, which would then, that policy coincides with this, where you could accept or deny the student from attending these things through those policies. So does this at all affect the 10 sick days or 10 personal days that they get? Or is this time completely separate from those days that are part of DPI? I believe they're completely separate due to it being a separate policy here. Okay. So I wonder. So I wonder if we could change that to the board or designee. The last sentence of the second paragraph, Diana. Yeah. Yep. We can do that. Thank you. 
bring it back to the next board meeting, Diana, or education? Um, I don't from anybody yet, but okay. if somebody would be willing to. I, uh, I move that we approve with that change. Second. Okay, motion by Danny, seconded by Rod. Further discussion? Hearing none, again, we'll do a roll call vote as this is a first reading. Damon? Yes. Danny? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kimberly? Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Leah? Yes. Rod? Yes. And I'm also yes, this policy is passed. All right, moving on to nine, citizens' comments. Do we have any citizens' comments? I'll ask again, any citizens' comments out there? We do have a couple of citizens on. Any citizens' comments? All right, we'll move on to 10, our list of future agenda items. As always, if you have any agenda items, uh, feel free to send them to Steve or myself, and we can get those included. Moving on to 11, our schedule of next meetings. I have a quick question on that. Yep. Community and legislative says at the district office that all the rest day virtually. Will that be virtual or are we yes, going to come to that? Yeah, I will make <laughs> arrangements for a Google Meet like this. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Just, just want to make sure. I don't want to not show up. <laughs> all right, now we'll move on to 12. Closed session, contemplate a closed session for section 19.851C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Jeff, seconded by Danny. Roll call, Damon? Yes. Danny? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Kimberly? Thank you. Uh, Leah? Yes. Rod? Yes. And I'm also yes. We'll take just a couple of minutes to get back into the other meeting, and we will see you all there in about five minutes. Excuse me, just if you don't oh, sure. mind me mentioning, uh, if, uh, we have a separate link for the closed session. I sent you an email sometime today, this morning, if you don't mind checking that, that will be our closed session link, please, and thank you.